It's time for the Nappy Time Lectures with the amateur sommelier. Sir. Hello and welcome to the next wine lecture in my unknown how many wine lecture series I'm going to do, frankly. This one, we're going to be discussing wine allergies. Now, most people think that they are allergic to sulfites, and that is the only thing in wine that they are possibly allergic to, and there's just nothing else. And that's so cringe, and I hate it, and I'm going to go insane, and yes, I have the computer devices back on, so cower in fear. Hell it. We have some objectives. Of course we do. We love objectives. We're going to differentiate between hypersensitivity and intolerance reactions. We're going to name the triggers of intolerance reactions to wine. And then we're going to describe the metabolism of ethanol and histamine. And I'm actually going to do this in different multiple parts, as you'll see when I clap my hands. Something of that nature. Because of a few things I do want to show you guys. So, we will begin. The source material that I was able to find, the greatest amount of information came from this article that I pulled up and is called Allergic and Intolerance Reactions to Wine. And it was actually done, I'm going to butcher this name very violently, so apologize in advance. B. Wuthrich. It's a Wuthrich. I don't speak German, even though I have a German last name. Anyway. <coughs> Allergology, select, it is the name of the journal. It is the second volume, apparently, with an NR1-2018 and pages 80 to 88. We also, well, I also technically, got a couple of other sources, Medical News Today, Cleveland Clinic, just for a few things. And so what we're going to start with is the background. And, as I have said... Sulfites are not the end-all be-all. Get over it. Thank you. Now, <clears throat> there was a study done in Copenhagen. It's a beautiful place, by the way. In 2006, there were a total of 13.9% hypersensitivity reactions among 6,000 individuals aged between 18 and 69 years old. That mainly came from red wine. Now, what were these symptoms? Some of you might be very familiar with them. 7.6% were of the upper respiratory. You have your sneezing, your runny nose, you're stuffed up, you're congested. It's terrible. You have 3.2% going into the lower respiratory tract, which is your cough, asthma, short of breath. And then the other 7.2%. That's interesting. That math doesn't add up. I'm going to have to look at that again. Somebody didn't do math right. Somewhere. Or dermatologic symptoms, where you had redness or flushing of the skin, you were constantly feeling itchy, and, you know, wish you had a back scratcher. I still don't have a back scratcher, even in my present day. Where would I even put it? I don't even know. Or there are hives. And nobody likes hives. So that's why everyone thinks it's an allergy. And we're going to get there. We're going to start with the hypersensitivity reactions, which most people think of as allergies. The hypersensitivity, the actual definition that comes from Medical News Today, is the extreme or unnecessary immune response to an antigen. What is an antigen? It's something that stimulates an immune response. Now, normally, you know, the antigens are things that actually require the immune response to happen, such as when we get sick, like bacteria, a virus. The extreme or unnecessary, that's dust, pollen, grass, in that field. There are four main types. They are types one through four. Uh, I will not go into those specifically for the course of this video. 
and that they are immune mediated. You usually get uh, different types of antibodies, uh, mainly the IgM and IgG. The IgM is your immediate antibody reaction. IgG is your long-term antibody reaction. So say you had the flu and you get a bunch of your IgM. You also have IgG. If you get flu again, the IgG, what it's supposed to do is be able to counter the second encounter with the flu much better. Hence, we have annual flu shots, but of course, in so being, the IgG will eventually wear off, and you need to have flu shots every year. Get your flu shots, please. <sighs> there are also these cool cells called T-cell lymphocytes, another part of the immune system that go after all of the bad things in the body that we don't like. And these hypersensitivities can range from immediate such as if you eat shellfish or nuts and you decide, oh, I'm allergic to that, I can't breathe, oh no, EpiPen. <laughs> to delayed, which are the skin reactions, like the contact dermatitis, the hives, it's very not good. These are mainly treated with steroids, antihistamines, and other drugs to help the immune system because the immune system can get easily overwhelmed and allow other things to come in like a bacteria a virus cause even more havoc and then you need drugs to help the immune system with the actual bad stuff because it's too focused on the not bad stuff hence so that becomes the fun exercise of what then is an intolerance. It is a non-allergy hypersensitivity reaction. These are known as pseudoallergenic, idiosyncratic, or anaphylactoid. They're like an allergy. They're like a hypersensitivity reaction, but they're not. And these do not involve the immune system at all. There are no antibodies. There are no T-cells. None of it. It is usually an issue with digestion of certain foods or drugs that causes irritation in the bowels, which makes it difficult to digest. Think of dairy. Dairy's a big one. And your range of symptoms are very broad to most doctors. It's nausea, it's stomach pain, diarrhea, gas or bloating. Okay, heartburn is... Kind of specific to some things. Kind of. I'm experiencing that as we speak. Headaches, um, even sometimes irritability and nervousness. And those treatments, you don't really need medication. The best way to treat is to avoid or reduce the intake of food, such as don't have the milk. Um, if you have a sensitivity to chocolate, don't eat the chocolate. It's very avoiding, very diet adjusted. For some of us, it's very sad. Hi. It is, it's very tragic. Now, I am going to show this particular slide. And I All right, everyone. To do that. So On this slide, this essentially is a chart of the hypersensitivity reactions to wine. And so you right see now. there are the non-toxic reactions to wine hypersensitivity. You have your immune-mediated, which we call as the actual hypersensitivity. That is what's considered a wine allergy. Uh, one type of antibody I failed to discuss in the previous slide uh, was IgG, not IgG, IgE, excuse me. And IgE is more associated with your allergies. So if you have an allergy, you'll have, in addition to some IgG and IgM, there's also going to be quite a bit of IgE. Yes, there are five types of antibodies, and for this wine lecture, you only need to worry about G, M, and E. I know, it gets very confusing very fast. 
I can assure you, immunology was not one of my stronger traits in the way that went. So, we then move along to the non-immune-mediated hypersensitivity. These are the wine intolerances. These do not involve the immune system. Now, on a next slide or two coming up, we'll have the enzymopathies. We will discuss that. We will have pharmacologic problems. Uh, that's basically wine chemistry stuff. You can see biogenic amines. We will get to those. And the unclears are additives that are obviously added to the wine during the winemaking process. And that is where we will discuss the sulfites in general. I hope you guys stick around. And now let's get back to the recording. Okay, so part two of our wine lecture here is actually going to be quite brief. Totally forgot about that. It's going to be literally one slide and then showing another picture, but we'll be back in a short moment. We'll start with the first hypersensitivity, and that is from ethanol metabolism. This is an enzymopathy, and you might know this as what's called flush syndrome. Your face reddens, there's possible hives involved, you have nausea, your blood pressure decreases, you get a migraine, or you get worsening asthma. And so how this is going to work, and I will show you guys the picture uh, once I'm done talking on this slide. There are two enzymes you have to worry about with alcohol metabolism. You have the ethanol, that is the chemical compound that we know as what I consider potable alcohol because in reality alcohol is actually an entire group of organic compounds that end with the hydroxyl group you guys know as OH and there's methanol there's ethanol there's propanol and I can literally keep going for you know hours we have no time for that so <clears throat> the first enzyme reaction is going to take alcohol dehydrogenase, and yes, it is dehydrogenase, for the love of fart, dehydrogenase. Yes. Not dehydrogenase. No, that's just disgusting. It's dehydrogenase. Now, anyway. The alcohol dehydrogenase has high activity. What does that even mean? It rapidly converts the ethanol to acetaldehyde. aldehyde. Fun fact for all of us chemistry nerds, there are two ways that enzymes in our body can rapidly produce compounds. One is the concentration of the enzyme itself, and I don't remember enzyme chemistry for anything, but it just does. People make more enzyme, some people take less. So the first way is to have a high amount concentration of the enzyme in the blood, uh, in this case, it's high activity. That means that the enzyme is basically working overtime to get the substrates that are in the body converted into what are called products. And the product that we are worried about is acetaldehyde, and the substrate is the ethanol. The problem with the acetaldehyde is the second part of the reaction, which will be on the slide, needs to be converted into acetate. Some people say acetic acid. I say acetate. And that is done by aldehyde dehydrogenase 2. I have no idea what one does. But for this, it is aldehyde dehydrogenase 2. And that is deficient. That is a low concentration. So what happens is the acetaldehyde builds up in the system. That's why your face reddens. That's where the hives come from. The nausea, low blood pressure, asthma, migraine. It's no bueno. It's just not. It's no bueno. So you'll mostly see this in 46% of Japanese people, 50%, 56%, I should say, of Chinese people because their bodies do not produce enough aldehyde dehydrogenase 2 
but they still have the high activity from normal alcohol dehydrogenase and it's just not a fun recipe or a fun time so I will quickly there's actually two reactions on this slide that I'll quickly show uh, you'll want to focus on the one on the left for this back in a minute I'm back! I know. Very shocking. That was very quick. Uh, second part of the slide. Actually, first part does two parts. Anyway, <clears throat> we start then on our next trip with grape proteins. And we're going to specifically go to what is called endochitinase 4A. It is a lipid transfer protein. And is mostly seen in young wines and a brand called Fragolino. And I'm not going to lie, never heard of Fragolino before I actually did this presentation. Not entirely sure what it is. Not entirely sure why there is a cat in my yard. And I can see it through the blinds. Sorry. Anyway. <clears throat> so, there are proteins in the grapes themselves, either grape skins or the actual grape meat that get in, they get fermented, and they stay intact, and you drink, and there you're like, <gasps> and it's not good. And so the next part, it's really brief on that, the next part is something that's horribly, awfully, and to most people kind of disgusting, is mold. Yes, there is actual mold in wine. Calm down. We're going to get there. The mold that we actually want in wine, because yes, there is a mold we want in wine, it is called Botrytis scenaria. That is what is called noble rot. Now, most molds, we think, should not be there whatsoever. These are called ignoble rots. They cause terrible things with our wine. When they ferment, we taste, we want to spit it out and immediately just throw a bunch of mouthwash in there, maybe some hydrogen peroxide, and then open another bottle and hope it's not contaminated. Noble rot is a different kind of mold that which, yes, it causes some kind of pruning and weird growth thing, but it makes the grapes sweet. And this is excellent for sweet wines. If there is noble rot in your sweet wine, that accentuates the sweetness and you're like, wow, candy. It's beautiful. There are also molds in the cellars and corks that get in the air. And these are Crisinilius, Cytophylla, Eucorplumbius, Penicillium glabrum, Aspergillus species. You know, stuff that's probably should not be in the cellar in the corks and should be addressed immediately. However, and fascinating enough, there are no documented cases known, and I say clearly, known by the molds at this time. Let's hope it stays that way. Unless you really need a doctor. That'll be a whole different research paper. There are also what are called protein-containing clearing agents. Say that five times fast, because I can't right now. <coughs> Obviously for acid. These are agents that clear the wine up, so usually it's cloudy. These agents will clear and stabilize the wine. They will resist various storage, transport, and temperature conditions. And they do this by removing dead yeast, bacteria, uh, what are called tartrates, proteins, pectins, uh, various other tannins and phenolic compounds. And these are going to be fish gelatin, what some people in business call isinglass. There's ovalbumin, uh, casein products, that's just dairy, and gum, Arabic. It's fun, depending on what your part of fun is. Next wine allergy also another disgusting portion, are insect proteins. 
Because, yes, insects can contaminate the mash when the grapes are pressed because they're flying around and saying, ooh, that smells sweet, and then poof, they get crushed, and they get in. And, yeah, that's fun. The venoms decompose during the fermentation, which in the Spanish study that was done, they couldn't really gain the reactant from the patients however their skin prick tests were positive with IgE antibodies against venom from Vespula and Polistes wasps very unusual very fascinating they didn't know why and then they found that it was fun this next wine allergy and this Kind of confuses me too, so I'm going to try to explain this as best as possible, even though there's not even a lot of information that I found in the paper. Aurora called cross reactive carbohydrate determinants. These are mostly glycoproteins, which basically means there are a couple glucose molecules attached to proteins, and they do lots of fun protein stuff. They just happen to have some sugar with them to do all of their fun stuff as well. And it's entertaining and exciting. And there's actually glycoproteins literally all over the place. Molecular biology is basically glycoproteins. We're not going to get into that. <clears throat> but if there is an allergy to glycoproteins in our wine drinker, such as bromelain, pollen, venom, dust mites, that can cause cross-reactions to the drinkers of the wine. For some reason, the wine has similar glycoproteins. The body thinks those similar glycoproteins are the actual glycoproteins that are in the allergy of interest here. They cross-react. It causes chaos. No one likes it. It's very unfun. And then finally, we have the inorganic wine components. Which I find is fascinating because ethanol is clearly organic, acetaldehyde is organic, and acetic acid is organic. So I don't know why they titled that inorganic. I think someone just really messed that one up. But the one part, the sulfites, we finally get here. Very rarely, I'll stress this, I know I put this in my allergy section, but very Rarely are there cases of hypersensitivity reactions, what we think is allergies. These are more frequently seen in intolerance reactions when we get there. And they are diagnosed with skin prick tests, where basically you put the antigen, allergen, onto literally, I have no idea, some kind of a needle. They put it under your skin, and then they would see if it reacts. If you have had a TB test recently or in the past, and that's basically kind of the same thing. And then you gotta get a red in 48 to 72 hours. And there's also histamine release tests. I'm not entirely sure what that is. We finally get to intolerance reactions. The pseudo-allergic reactions. Your main triggers that you're gonna look for well, the chemicals of interest. Ethanol, acetaldehyde, acetic acid. There are flavonoids, which are anthocyanins and catechins, what other people just group into the tannin section. And sulfites itself, histamine, and other biogenic amines. Commonly, you're going to get urticaria, hives. It's non allergenic, you're not activating the immune system. It's just intolerance. You probably shouldn't have drank it in the first place. If you didn't know, now you do. Very unfortunate, too. And so, we'll start with fusel alcohol. Yes, I'm going to keep the suspense in here. What the heck is fusel alcohol? It is a long-chain alcohol group, particularly frequent in extract-rich wines. I have no idea what those are. I didn't even know this compound even existed. They are slowly depleted by the body and have anesthetic effects. And they are in fact responsible 
for hangovers. What we've actually been looking for this entire time is fusel alcohol to figure out how to combat the hangover problem. It is not going to be showering. It is not drinking a lot of water, although water does help. No, probably need some electrolytes of that water. Just saying. It's also, how do I say? It becomes a problem if there's bad fermentation. If something gets in there, there's a contaminant in the barrel, over stainless steel, something goes bad in fermentation, and then you get some fusel alcohol, and it's, it's not pretty. Now, we are, oh my gosh, my battery's about to die. Excuse me for one second. Woohoo! I'll cut that on that end. Hopefully. <laughs> If I don't, sorry. I just need to plug my laptop in. <clears throat> now we're getting to sulfites. Why are these things in here? Because we don't want our wines to turn brown or grow harmful microorganisms. Because if we do, and they're not in there, it's a really bad time. These are the vinegar-producing bacteria. They, I don't even know which ones actually are specifically. I don't think they said in the paper. And if they do, I'm sorry. But basically, they turn the wine to vinegar. Who wants to drink straight vinegar? Okay, I know some people actually drink straight vinegar, but we're, we're trying to drink wine, not vinegar. If a wine is labeled as wine, hopefully it is not vinegar, because we're not going to have a fun time with that. Also, wild yeasts or molds that just contaminate the wine, get in there. It is um, it's not a good time. Here's the other fun piece of the puzzle. Sulfite intolerances are commonly seen in white wines. Okay, reds do contain sulfites. I know. But these are commonly seen more in whites. White wines have a higher concentration of sulfites. Everyone says the reds have the sulfites. No. Well, yes, but no. Whites are going to be your problem. You can drink white. You can't drink red. Guess what? It ain't the sulfites, kiddo. We'll get there. Don't worry. And so how the sulfites cause problems is that they um, stimulate receptors from the sulfur dioxide generated stomach. These irritate, what's it called? <coughs> Just like there, the bronchus gets irritated there's issues transferring air in the lungs it's not good nobody likes that it's very sad what you are actually experiencing if you can drink whites but you cannot drink reds are the flavonoids catechin epicatechin and anthocyanin which we group in the industry is tannins these are responsible for the red wine color you will know that the red wine color comes from the grape skin that is where the tannin is the red wines will ferment with the grape skins on the tannin and flavonoids of interest are where you're getting your problems how two enzymes Catechol O methyltransferase and phenol sulfotransferase. Do not try to say that five times fast. I can't. So, these two enzymes together are inhibited and prolong catecholamine activity. This allows for the phenols that are in the tannin and the flavonoids to pass through the blood-brain barrier without getting metabolized and then cause the migraines. Obviously, more common in reds than whites because the grape skins of interest are in the reds during the fermentation process. How do you test this without wine? Very easily. Chocolate. Yes, because by giving the patient chocolate, 
The dry mass in chocolate contains 12 to 18 percent polyphenols. These are also part of the tannoflavonoid group. If you get a headache, you get a migraine from, I would say, one whole bar. I'm not sure if one piece is going to do it unless you're really sensitive. But the chocolate can be used rather than the red wine to see, yes, there is an issue with your ability to drink red wine because your body is having an issue with the two enzymes which allow these compounds to pass the blood-brain barrier. I have a migraine. It's unfortunate. I feel sorry for you. I really do because red is my favorite. Now, before this third part, which will be the histamine and biogenic amines, I am going to put up the, whatchamacallit, slide. Okay, everyone. Photo. We are back to so our two charts. We're going to focus on the reaction on that, the right uh, this time. Right back. The oh, body, when histamine is encountered, has two pathways. The most common is going to be diamond oxidase. It's called DAO. Some people call it histaminase. That converts the histamine into imidazole acetic acid, which then will go through phosphoribosyl transferase, another enzyme, to become an imidazole acetic acid riboside. I'm going to be very honest. Oh, there's the ribose right there. Okay, never mind. I was really confused where the heck the ribose came in, but there it is. The other pathway for the body is to first use histamine and methyl transferase to create an N-methyl histamine, which also has to go through diamine oxidase and monoamine oxidase B. Why it's monoamine oxidase B and not A, or what even is A, I'm not even entirely sure, but it takes two reactions with that to produce N methyl imidazole acetic acid. Yes, this stuff is really complicated. It's why I struggled massively in organic chemistry. Nonetheless, <clears throat> you can see in both these pathways, the diamond oxidase is a major component in both of these. Now, if I just do little bit of this. I'm actually going to skip ahead. So the normal body has diamond oxidase in the small intestine, the liver, the kidneys, and what are called mast cells. Most people in the medical field that I know and work around know mast cells as basophils. I don't know who made up the mast cell thing. I think that's just weird stuff for doctors because they just want to be complicated. Now, <laughs> the diamond oxidase is meant to combat the histamine. The alcohol, in general, inhibits diamond oxidase. More so, really, in wine than any other alcohol in general because there's also a lot of histamine in wine, particularly your reds. And that allows the histamine to go through the intestinal walls because the alcohol also increased the permeability of those intestinal walls. The histamine goes through the intestines along with other biogenic amines. They get into the blood, they get into the blood-brain barrier, they cause migraines. It's not a fun time. It's just really, really not. And it's incredibly unfortunate. And they are produced during malolactic fermentation, also called secondary fermentation. I'll just leave this up and do this slide here while we're at it. So if there's uncontrolled fermentation where you're just like, okay, this is fermenting too fast, we need to do something, or just going too slow, and then try to pick it up and then just don't even do anything after that that causes 
excess secondary fermentation, a bunch of histamines get produced. If there's deficient hygiene in the cellar, then we have also extra secondary fermentation. Now your histamine and biogenic amines are going to be histamine, obviously, tyramine, cadaverine, putrescine, which I thought was just a made-up word, but no, it's not. And then for all of us with bad tastes and jokes, there's spermine and spermidine. Yes, those actually existed. I couldn't believe it either. Now, the culprits of all of this histamine and derivatives are done by Oenococcus oeni, which is a bacteria used for wine. There are lactobacillus species, pediococcus species, and yeasts, which do the bulk of the fermenting. The grape varieties that also can produce a lot of histamine and then are fermented, they are sensitive to pests and mildew, so they actually upregulate their biogenic amines and their degradation products, including hydrogen peroxide and aldehydes. Now, the good news is some of the histamine can be removed by what's called bentonite. I haven't actually looked up what bentonite is. Nonetheless, the sad part is you cannot fully remove the histamines. What you can do is drink the lower histamine wines, which are your whites and your rosés. Your reds and champagnes, however, have the higher amounts. It is very unfortunate. And so now we will go back to what we can do and then wrap this thing up. Woo! I know, that's a lot. So much. Very unfortunate. I apologize entirely. Not really. So what do we do about our wine allergies, intolerances? How, how, do, we, how do we work around this? So my unlicensed medical professional opinion which I am certified as a medical laboratory scientist, surprised in the entire world, but I'm not licensed to be a doctor, so don't ask for doctoral advice from me. I'm terrible at these things. I barely take care of myself, if you haven't noticed. There's allergy testing. You can speak to your primary care physician. You may be referred to an allergenist, a specialist, obviously, in allergies. They can do skin prick testing. Those are usually screens. What... I used to do at the other lab I worked at was actually have the serum tested. We actually sent it to a different lab. They called it RAS testing. There's like some kind of allergy serum testing. I don't remember what the R stands for. But that basically is going to confirm what your allergies are. So. If you are not a fan of needles, well, actually, there's probably needles and skin pricking, but if you're not a fan of blood, you might want to start with skin pricking. If you just want to rip the Band-Aid off and figure it out, serum testing is probably where you're going to want to go. Be warned, they need a lot of blood. And I mean, like, a lot. I think our requirement was 5 mils of serum, and when you spin it down, it's usually about half and half for your serum and red cells. So you're going to need about 10 mils of blood. For laboratory testing, 10 mils of blood is a lot of blood. A lot. So, you can do that. There are medications. There are antihistamines. Obviously, you can take those. Um, I'm not sure how well this works. There's possible supplementation for diamond oxidase i kind of looked at it myself it kind of helps i guess i don't know i've had mixed reactions when i've done it a couple times and the probably easiest way to avoid wine allergies wine intolerances 
is to limit or avoid the alcohol. Now, I'm going to be very blunt about this. That does not keep the lights on in this area. Granted, the YouTube channel does not keep the lights on in the area, period. However, what kind of a sick fiend tells people to limit their alcohol consumption in the name of wine allergies or wine tolerances? Certainly not the amateur sommelier. I, I mean, seriously, you guys know my reputation, so. That's just the quote professional advice. The amateur advice is just throw a bunch of biochemicals in the area and see what happens because that's more fun and also why I'm probably, you know, in the situation I'm currently in. Nonetheless, thank you guys so much for watching. I know that was a very long, laborious lecture. If you did enjoy, leave a like, subscribe to the channel, comment about the other wine lectures you want to see. If something interests you, let me know in the comments. And we'll be back next week, question mark? Maybe two weeks. I'm not entirely sure. I'm going to be honest. I just started a new week. It is the 4th of July. I am not sure when the heck this is going to go up. I'm not even sure how much research I'm going to be doing on my topic. I probably don't even know what my next topic is. So I need comments. I need suggestions. Let's work on that. Good night, everybody.